Now on BBC One, Luquesa Burak has this week's Inside Out East Midlands. Hello and welcome to Bradgate Park in Leicestershire. Here's what's coming up on tonight's programme. Critically injured on tram tracks, why cyclists say lives are at risk. What happens if that hadn't been a car, it had been a tram? That's just going to cut you in two. Also tonight, cashing in on victory, does a Foxes win mean a Leicester windfall? The city is still buzzing, it really is. There's a newfound uh, self-confidence. And the African-Caribbean miners revisiting their memories. This is as if I know him. I'm Lucrasa Burak and this is Inside Out East Midlands. Well first tonight, we're all being encouraged to become more active, to walk and to cycle more, to ditch our cars and to hop on a bus or a tram. But in some cities, riders are boycotting certain sections of tram track following a spate of accidents. In Nottingham, one cyclist was so badly injured that he was given last rights in hospital. Safety campaigners fear that it's only a matter of time now before someone is killed. Mari Ashby has our first report. <laughs> Someone's fractured their skull. I've had a few people where they've had to leave their jobs because the accidents have been so severe. He's got injuries to his face, a closed injury to his right elbow, an open fracture to his left forearm. There will always be parts of a tram line that are more hazardous for cyclists than other parts. I mean, that, that goes without saying. One thing that we have been really concerned about is that there would be a fatality on the tram network. Nottingham, Sheffield and Edinburgh. Three cities where councils embraced the tram, but three cities where there's been an increase in the number of cyclists coming into conflict with certain sections of track. I think there was about 24 bones broken or 24 breaks. My rib cage was pretty crushed. Ribs broken on the right hand side and the, there was double breaks on the left hand side which had to be pinned. You realise somebody is serious when they're in an induced coma and to be in an induced coma for about 16 days. And I was operated on pretty quickly. It's thanks to the team at the QMC that I'm alive. You know. In Beeston, the tram line on Chilwell High Road had only been open three months when keen cyclist John Melia's bike wheel got caught in the track. It took nine people to lift the car that went over him. Inside-out cameras were filming in the region's major trauma unit when he was brought in. Somebody just slips into the tram lines at the wrong times, thrown off in front of something, then that could be it. I mean, the things that would go through my mind is what happens if that hadn't been a car, it had been a tram. And there's a tram, you know, we're just going straight through into you. That's just going to cut you in two. John's injuries are the most serious on this stretch of Nottingham tram track so far, but safety campaigners say one vital ingredient is missing here. The main difference about this section is the lack of space on the road through here. There isn't space for cycle lanes or cycle paths alongside, which there is on much of the rest of the two new routes. So cyclists are much more at risk because uh, they can't easily get away from the tram tracks. What options do cyclists actually have? Either you take the sign route behind the tram stop uh, which is signed with red markings and the okay. special signs, but it's a rather narrow shared path and a bit annoying for cyclists and pedestrians to ride through there, especially when the shops are busy. The second option is to pull out and ride through the tram stop between the tram tracks. Further up the same road at Cycle Inn Bike Shop opposite where John was critically injured, the owner says dozens of their customers have also had wheels stuck in the tracks. 
not only have you got obviously the, the tram line, but also you know ridges in the road here. It doesn't leave a great deal. Um, obviously the tram can't overtake the cyclist. The cyclist has to sit in this lane here. Normally with the result of the tram riding up behind the cyclist and dinging the bell to get the cyclist to get a bit of a hurry up on, which is, you know, can cause uh, panic sometimes. 48 injuries on this one stretch of track have been reported to the local MP, who's been campaigning for more visible safety signs. Some of those injuries happened during construction, but the majority since it opened in August 2015. Is this going to be marked at points along here? Along to, On here, yes. Along, uh, Cycle safety campaigners in Nottingham believe many more injuries go unreported, and according to the County Council, they're only recorded officially if the emergency services are called to the scene. We knew there was a particular problem at the tram stop. I think what really did it was when John damn nearly died, and that's the awful truth of it. He's a very lucky man to be alive. And that was like for everybody, that was the final straw. And even though I'd been banging on about it for years, finally they had no alternative but to take it very seriously. Back at the QMC for one of numerous visits since he came off his bike, John's learning about the true extent of his injuries for the first time. You really are quite stuck, aren't you? And just relax from as much as you can. And you can see that here's your heart, here's the tube going down your throat helping you breathe, and there's a tube into your chest helping with the lung injury. So I repaired that for you at the time, yeah. but that does mean that you're never going to be perfect, unfortunately. Yeah. So you probably will always be a little bit short of breath. As John waits to find out if he'll need more surgery, cyclists and safety campaigners in the two other tram cities we're looking at have been taking matters into their own hands. We've had 306 accidents reported to us since I set up the website in January 2015. Our Yorkshire neighbour Sheffield was the first UK city to take back the tram, but 22 years down the line, cyclists are still being injured on the tracks and safety campaigners here are now the first to actively monitor exactly how many. We hope that you know, if we could present Sheffield Council with the numbers of accidents and that might prompt them to take some action about the problem. There was a van right behind me. The point at which um, I needed to turn, I would have had to go across into the path of the van to take the angle more safely, but couldn't do that. So I ended up coming off just at that particular point. In Edinburgh, solicitor Stuart White is representing more than 120 cyclists in what's being seen as a compensation test case for the rest of the country. The injuries uh, range from scuffs and scrapes to some more serious injuries um, involving fractures. So we could be talking anything uh, from three figures up to five figures. One has to bear in mind that it only runs on, on road for just over a mile. and There's been hundreds of accidents, but it's serious because there's been two accidents in the last month or so involving a cyclist who came off his bike and ended up underneath a bus. This cycle safety film on the Nottingham Express Transit website shows cyclists how to approach the tracks at the right angle. But some very experienced cyclists say they won't take the risk on Chilwell High Road, including the local cycling club. You've got cars, then you've got bikes, you've got trams, you've got buses, all in a congested area. We boycott it. So, with some cyclists avoiding this stretch of tram track, does the City Council acknowledge there's a problem? There are always going to be areas of the city that are safer than other areas. And if statistically, we're seeing that there are particular stretches of road that have got higher numbers of incidents, and I think that's always going to be the case in any city, then we need to look at it, we need to make sure that we improve what we can improve, um, and we also need to educate cyclists. Is that section of tram track on Chilwell High Road, is it safe? It is safe if you cycle in the right way, you approach it at the right angle, you use the signs available, very clear signs, to show you how you should approach those key areas. And if you do it in the right way, absolutely it's safe. The City Council now has plans for a segregated cycle superhighway in this area.
John's bike survived the ordeal better than he did. The police have now returned it. In December, it'll be a year since he was critically injured. More surgery could still be on the cards. His family believe what happened to him is a warning that can't be ignored. I would say, look at him, look at all the seriousness. We nearly lost him, you know. You can't put a price on somebody's life. You know, they need to do something before some other people has to go through what we've all been through. And we all wish John the very best with his recovery. Now, it was the biggest sporting story of the year, possibly of the century, and arguably of all time. Leicester City went from near relegation to Premier League champions in little over a year. The whole world now knows the 5,000 to 1 fairy tale. But we want to know, did success for the Foxes mean a cash windfall for the entire city? It was a moment the city will never forget. And that feeling of becoming Premier League champions, priceless. Come on, we've done it! Come on! The party's over, in one sense, but uh, the city is still buzzing, it really is. Uh, there's a newfound uh, self-confidence. But will self-confidence mean cash? We know the players have made the most of becoming footballing stars, but can the city turn the win into a windfall? Well, Inside Out asked experts from De Montfort University to sit down and work out a figure. It's almost like having a mini Olympics in your city and having the impact of that. We'll see what they come up with a bit later. Kate Street, Leicester. The rear wall of a city electrical store has become a place of pilgrimage. The vibe in the city um, and the optimism in the city has been fabulous and we as a company wanted to give something back to the community, we wanted to be a part of that vibe. Just incredible, just to be part of what's going on in Leicester, I mean I've grown really attached to the place within, you know, just in three weeks, I don't even know how I'm going to go home. More and more people from all around the world have heard about it and, and have travelled considerable distances to, to come and see it. We're from New Zealand. From Parapurumu, a small town out of Wellington. Just so lifelike, all the players yeah. are so lifelike. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. And throughout the city, six more murals emerged. It seems if you want a slice of Leicester's luck, it helps if you're called Lee. Lee Herbert was one of the punters who placed a bet on the Foxes at 5,000 to 1. A few months later, he's bought his fiancée a new car with part of his £20,000 winnings. And he's hoping he's still got the Midas touch. I've gotten to win the Champions League, Premier League and the FA Cup as a, as a treble just to build the odds up to, to somewhere near 5,000 to one again, and I put another five on it. <laughs> Stranger things have happened, and they really <laughs> have. They have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, they don't get much stranger than this. It's Ladies' Day at Leicester Racecourse. Mr Barney's with us, everybody, give us a wave. Until a few weeks ago, today's guest of honour was a postman in the city. But since that moment on the Leicester team bus, Lee Chapman has been working as a professional Jamie Vardy look-alike. I'm riding this wave until the wave is, well, come ashore, really. Where's it going to go? We've got Champions League football, he's staying with Leicester. 
we could do well in that because score some crucial goals against some big sides that will bring me more work our third lucky lee is perhaps the fox's biggest fan and his loyalty goes more than skin deep he can't wait to follow leicester's champions league journey so we're going Portugal, Belgium and Denmark. Happy days. Superfan Lee is getting used to hopping on and off planes. He's just returned from a trip to Thailand, courtesy of the Leicester City owners. I mean, I'm just so like overwhelmed by it all still. Met staff from Leicester City that worked over in Thailand. Uh, went into the slums to give gifts out to the kids in the slums. We gave them a lot of new footballs, new goals. Um, a lot of sports equipment. It's probably as crazy in Thailand for people stopping me as it is in Leicester. It was it was mad. Like I couldn't understand it. I must have spoke to hundreds and hundreds of people about the whole Leicester City story, and a lot of them kind of knew it. I mean, a lot of them had Leicester shirts on. Across town at Leicester's New York Museum, the Fearless Foxes exhibition has attracted more than 60,000 visitors. Almost double a King Power Stadium capacity crowd. We've collected newspaper cuttings from around the world that are just reflecting, but I don't think there's a country that this hasn't been a big story. And that's an amazing thing. It's more than just football. It's more than just sport. People are fascinated by that under, underdog achievement. In Hamilton, the next generation have found new heroes to inspire them. I hear young players wanting to be a Jamie Vardy rather than a Wayne Rooney, so yeah, it's had a great impact. Our development sessions have increased in numbers with more local kids. More communities from different parts of the city are getting involved, and I think that's definitely come on the back of Leicester's success. If Leicester City can win the Premier League, it gives all of us belief we can achieve our dreams. Leicester has just been named the UK's greatest sporting city. But off the football pitch, local businesses have been cashing in on success. We took triple what we usually take on a Saturday. A lot of pubs couldn't open on the Sunday because they'd run out. But they weren't just short-term gains. This deli and restaurant came here instead of Birmingham. We even had a discussion about the, the design up here to have the boxes in it somewhere because, you know, they, they are so close to people's hearts at the moment. So, back to our experts. Do they think Leicester can climb the economic league table? The impact has been quite significant. If we start by looking at uh, the local economy, the effect of the club's win on the feel-good factor, people coming out to watch the games, to celebrate the victories, all of these had a tremendous impact on the local economy. So what's their final figure? Drum roll please. Leicester City Football Club's win had at least a 500 million pound impact on the city in terms of generating revenue for local retailers and the sports club itself. A minimum of 500 million pounds, but up to 866 million pounds. 866 million. Leicester City didn't just win the Premier League, it helped the whole city win the lottery. You just can't get your head around how much money that really is, can you? It's, it really you haven't is. got your head around the win yet. Well, no, it's still <laughs> not the win. <laughs> yeah, those numbers don't surprise me, really. Uh, I think it's absolutely fantastic, and I think it will just grow and grow. The success of our football team is something that is bringing significant numbers of people to the city, bringing them here as visitors, bringing them here to shop, bringing them here to invest, and that is undoubtedly having a major positive impact. And good luck to Leicester as they kick off their Champions League campaign this week.
Now, when the last deep coal mine in the East Midlands shut last year, it marked the end of an era. Coal mining was dirty and it was dangerous, but in its heyday, it provided jobs for 750,000 men. Now, one story that hasn't been told until now is the role of African Caribbean miners in the industry. Local historian Norma Gregory has set up a special project to research and record their contribution to coal mining in the East Midlands. They're in their 70s and 80s now, but once upon a time, these men did one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. They dug coal for Britain, and underground, at least, they were treated as equals. The comradeship, the togetherness. When you depended on each other, there was no room for racism. Everybody got to unite. You can't go down there with anything in your heart about Tom, Dick, or Harry. You, get to, you all have to get together. On board this coach are miners and their families. We're going on a journey back in time. Today really is about uh, a chance for many miners, particularly Afro-Caribbean miners, um, to get together and to visit one of the key places in Nottinghamshire where you can learn about mining heritage, um, and that's Billsthorpe Mining Museum. In the late 1940s, people from the West Indies, still part of the British Empire, began to arrive in the UK. They were tempted by the promise of work. They were saying that oh, there's plenty of jobs and who want to come is, can come freely. Yeah? And they will look after you as you do. My parents arrived from Jamaica in the 1960s and settled in Nottingham. My school was next to Gedley Miners Welfare Club. At 88, Fitzalbert Taylor is the oldest miner here today. Born in Jamaica, he arrived in Britain in 1954 and settled in Nottingham. He worked as a miner for 25 years. It is as if I know him. I never thought that I would have felt you know, so emotional. And when I see that bloke, it, the lifestyle, you know, you, I've been there. And this is a, a list of all the people killed at Billsthorpe. The museum guides all worked at Billsthorpe Colliery. They remember the few black miners at the pit with fondness and respect. And these two lads came up, these West Indians I suppose they were, uh, and they'd never seen snow before. They were jumping about and, and what in the face and all this and snowballing and everything. They're part of the team, that's it. You just didn't think of them any other way as to get on with it, get on with your job and you work together. Many people wouldn't go down and these guys are willing. It's bringing back loads of memories, loads of memories. Uh, wow, my head's just buzzing, it's just buzzing. Gary Mitchell may look the part, but it's 30 years since he was last down a pit. Once a working colliery in Wakefield, this is now a museum. The one place left in England where you can see what life was really like underground. 460 feet down, and I'm not the only one shocked by what it looks like when we emerge into the darkness. Oh, Lord of mercy. I'd like to say it's like I've never been away, but uh, I can't believe I used to work down here. So why did you do this type of work, knowing that the risk was so high? Come down to one thing, darling, it's the money. Because when I'm getting almost three times what I used to get at my other job. So it was all about the money at the end of the day. As a black miner, did you ever feel you were treated any differently? Um, not down here, not down, down in mine. We like I said, we're like family down here, but to look out for each other in general. Um, but we went, went back on surface, the different story altogether. It's like everyone seems to just go their own way. Um, black people probably just stick together and white, you know, it, it just white. That's, that's just what it was.
back on the coach and we're heading to the former site of Gedling Colliery in Nottingham. It's a pit that's very poignant to the African Caribbean community as many of the black miners worked at Gedling Colliery. Joe Murray, there was Winston Barrett, Lindsay, he was one of the second generation ones. That's where I thought we would have gone. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. In its heyday, there were more than 200 African Caribbean miners at Gedling, 10% of the workforce. It was known as the Pit of Nations. We were in a recruitment situation at the time where I needed to set six people a week on just for the just to maintain the numbers of people employed. Did you find that some of the other collieries didn't take on as many people from diverse communities? Was that the case? That was, yes, because uh, a lot of the, what, what, what I term pit villages, uh, a lot of the Derbyshire villages obviously were pit villages uh, and it was a fairly closed community. <laughs> In 1954, about 10,000 West Indians came to Britain. In 1955, it is believed another 15,000 will make the long journey. Not everyone was pleased to see the new arrivals. In 1958, tensions boiled over in Nottingham. Fights broke out between black and white men, triggered reportedly by a black man talking to a white woman. Now, Mr. Iron, who do you feel is responsible for all this trouble? I don't think any section of the community can be blamed for it. Um, I think it's uh, something that grows steadily over past misunderstanding. It was a rough, rough 58. They had a um, bicycle chain, things like that. You were really lucky to be alive if you go out after six o'clock. What kind of things happened? Well, there was people who would say to her, oh, you want to go back home, or where you come from, and things like that, you know. Attitudes have changed quite a bit. A matter of colour in those days was one thing, but now it's totally different altogether, like, you know. People don't look at colour anymore. They just look at the individual, what you got in here, type of thing, like. This is your hat. With your light on. The next stop is the African Caribbean Centre in Nottingham. The miners have brought their families along for a tribute night. The darkness, the, the kind of claustrophobia, the work that the men had to do, it shocked me. The one remaining pit in the East Midlands closed last year. Coal mining may have been consigned to the history books, but the contribution made by African Caribbean men is only just emerging. Our final stop is a pub in Mansfield. Despite these miners working at Gedlin Pit for many years, they never saw the colliery banner. But we've tracked it down, and there, in all its glory, is proof of just how diverse the workforce was. Yeah, it makes you feel a part of the whole thing, you know. And then our children can say, well, Daddy worked down at Gedlin, you know. And thank you to Norma for collecting all those wonderful memories from underground. Well, that's it from us this week, but here's a sneak preview of what's coming up next Monday. We've got a rubbish programme next week, quite literally. We're out with the council workers who have to clear up the mess in our countryside. Human waste, dog waste, uh, I've had a few dead horses. That weren't a very nice one, it was a bit smelly.